Good morning, everyone. So thank you so much for uh, NCAN for inviting me. So hope this morning we are going to talk about uh, managing of carcinoid syndrome. We are going to know from the beginning what is the problem which led to the carcinoid syndrome, what other complication can happen because of elevated serotonin, and how we can manage and control that. Do we have our slides? This is our, my disclosures. So what is the history? A anyone here is Italian? So I can mess with the pronouncing the name. So 1935, starting with Vittorio Ersamper in Rome, he was actually very interested to be a lawyer, and then he changed his career to be in the pharmacology science, and then he showed, he was very interested in the smooth muscle and how they are contracting. So he discovered that there are specific material called the entramine, which is really helps the enterochromaffin cells and getting from the enterochromaffin cells and the helping the smooth muscle contraction. At this time, we didn't know what is serotonin is. About 10 years after that, in Cleveland Clinic, my neighbors in Ohio, they discovered a specific chemical in the blood which controlling the vascular tone, the tone of the blood vessel. So it is coming from the blood. This is where it's zero coming from, and it's controlling the tone. So the name serotonin coming from that. And then about a couple of years after that, they discovered that the entramine in the beginning is the same like the serotonin. So this is the history of discovering serotonin and where is the name coming from. I will have a hard time this morning with that. So how does our body form serotonin? You need that from an essential amino acid. Essential amino acid that you need it from a specific type of food. Your body cannot make, an, make an enough uh, you know, uh, specific uh, tryptophan. So you need that from a specific food. And through a specific chemical reaction, through the tryptophan hydroxylase, you form a component called the 5 hydroxy tryptophan and then through a specific chemical reaction, decarboxylation, you form the serotonin. So they, again, that's something you need for a specific type of food, and that's why we found that some food will make some our, of our patients who are having carcinoid syndrome to have more carcinoid features sometimes. So where is the serotonin in our body? Most of them actually is formed in your gut from the enterochromaffin cells, and it has specific functions in your gut regulating your motility, your gut you know, movement, absorption of some nutrients, and only 10% in the CNS or the brain area. There also minority will come from the skin, and that's why if the serotonin is very high, our patient gets something called scleroderma, or thickening of, your, of the skin, loss of the elasticity. It also can come from the bronchial cells, and that's why some of the lung neuroendocrine tumor can produce serotonin and they will have carcinoid features. So what is the most important function of serotonin? Again, in your gut, which is the majority, it can control the bowel function, the motility. It can protect your gut from some of the toxins, so it can uh, enhance or make the digestion process rapid, so to get rid of the toxins. And that's why if you have a lot of serotonin, sometimes you complain of nausea. It also can help controlling your appetite. In the brain, it's very common to be the mood hormone. So it's uh, what we call the natural feeling good chemical. It controls the mood. It also regulates the body temperature, the sleep, and you know, sexual behavior. So if you have too much serotonin, you can have a lot of troubles. Also, if you have lack of serotonin, your patient start having problems with the gut motility. They can develop depression, being anxious, and mania. So again, too much serotonin at the same time, by definition, that the tumor is secreting serotonin definitely much more than your body needs. And that's why we start having the problem or the complications. Serotonin is not the only chemical the neuroendocrine tumor is producing. They can produce serotonin, histamine, kinines, prostaglandins. But when we talk about carcinoid syndrome and carcinoid features, we definitely mean the serotonin. This is the main troublemaker for our patients. So facts about that, it's almost half of our patients will have 
functional uh, neuroendocrine tumors. I'm talking about the small bowel or the mid-gut neuroendocrine tumors. Most of these patients who will develop carcinoid features and carcinoid syndrome will be either a small bowel, less common will be the lung. So if you are someone with a mid-gut or a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor well differentiated, this is the patient at high risk of developing carcinoid features. Also, if you are someone with a typical bronchial carcinoid, in less extent we see with the atypical, but typical is the most one, you also can produce serotonin, histamine, and you can have carcinoid features or sometimes atypical carcinoid uh, syndrome if you're producing histamine and some other chemicals. And most of these patients will already have metastatic disease because your liver have a function or capacity to deactivate the, the, the increased serotonin and inactivate it. But if your liver is already occupied with metastatic lesions, it lost the optimum function to deactivate this elevated serotonin. And then the patient starts having the carcinoid features and carcinoid complications as well. So is the carcinoid feature is the only thing we are worried about? Just increased diarrhea and flushing? Obviously not. It can cause a lot of complications as well. One of them can be life-threatening, like carcinoid crisis. We are going to go to every one of them in details. It also, the carcinoid by itself, or have elevated serotonin, can definitely impact the quality of life, even before developing the other complications. And I'm going to show you that in a couple of the slides as well. One of the uh, serious complications would be the carcinoid heart disease. But believe it or not, the fibrosis is not only in the cardiac valves. It can also in your skin, causing scleroderma. It can cause in the mesentery, which is the mesh attaching your intestine with the abdominal uh, wall. And the patient can have mesenteric fibrosis and bowel obstruction. And it can cause also pulmonary hypertension, affecting the vessels connecting your heart with the lung. So this is just an over view of what is uh, carcinoid syndrome and all the complications our patient can develop from excess serotonin. So it has shown that you know, just having elevated 5-HIA uh, or serotonin and carcinoid feature, even before developing the complication, can impact your quality of life. When they did a study asking the patient about how much carcinoid features they have and see how much 5-HIA they have, they saw that these patients, as you can see in the graphs going down, they will have less physical function, less social activity. Just, you know, like think about it for a minute. This is patient having a lot of diarrhea. They are very anxious to get out of the home sometime. If they are in the supermarket, they would like to finish quickly or just rushing to the nearest bathroom. So this patient having a lot of anxiety all the time. This patient can develop depression because it deprives them from a lot of social activity that they need to do. And also they will be less active. So having the carcinoid feature by itself, having uncontrolled elevated serotonin, even before developing any of the complication, can impact the quality of life. And this patient tend to have a worse quality of life. But that's not the only story. Also the patient who have more carcinoid syndrome uncontrolled when they did the analysis for the insurance database and the Medicare, they found that the patient who claimed more than two or three carcinoid, um, you know, like episodes, and they, all the time they have a lot of uncontrolled diarrhea and flushing, and then they uh, basically analyzed that with the overall survival. They found that this patient with uncontrolled, more claiming of uh, carcinoid features, they do have poor outcome and less overall survival compared to the patients who have a controlled carcinoid features and have controlled serotonin. And not all these patients actually having all the complication of elevated serotonin. Some of them did not develop it yet and they still have an impact in their overall outcome. So elevated serotonin before going to any complications can impact the quality of life, can be associated also with lower overall survival compared to the patient who have a controlled serotonin or have controlled carcinoid syndrome. So carcinoid crisis, definitely it's one of the life-threatening conditions, and that's very important to talk to your um, net specialist and talk to your surgeon if you are going to have any procedure or surgery. Usually it's struggled by any stress or tumor manipulation. Someone will have uh, surgery, liver-directed therapy, 
someone is going to have any anesthesia, someone is going to have radionuclide therapy sometimes as well, especially if they have high tumor bulk. These patients, the, the lesions, when they get stressed or crazy, it's just releasing a lot of chemicals from the tumor, including serotonin, histamine, dopamine, and other chemicals as well. And this can affect the organ function and lead to hemodynamic instability, which can be life-threatening in some times. So any patients who have um, functional mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor is going to have a major surgery. You have to talk to your oncologist, you have to talk to your surgeon, and make sure we consider the octreotide drip or the high polis octreotide dose before the surgery. The data about that is, is conflicting, which means we don't have a universal agreement that anyone go to surgery, you have to have the octreotide. And institutions are doing the doses completely different. But definitely, if you have a functional mid-gut, that's a worth discussion. I think we should definitely consider it. If someone has a mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor and is not secreting hormones, and you don't have a, a lot of tumor burden, I think a lot of surgeons tend not to use or consider octreotide drip routinely in these patients. So these some factors will affect the decision of your surgeon oncologist, but always keep that in your mind. If you are someone having carcinoid features, if you are someone having elevated serotonin, you have to consider that and discuss that you have the option of octreotide drip Sometimes we give a big dose before surgery and then continuous for 48 hours. So that's something you need to discuss with your oncologist. So carcinoid heart disease. How is the lesion in your med gut can affect your heart? We are going to discuss the mechanism, which patients are at risk for developing carcinoid heart disease, how we can manage it, what is the diagnosis and the treatment, and who should follow this patient and the importance of having a multidisciplinary team. So the cardiology and cardiothoracic surgeons will be in the program of neuroendocrine tumors if you need them. So it starts with patients with mid-gut or small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, or they have a functional bronchial carcinoid. What happens that these patients already have metastatic disease in the liver? So the, the liver will not be able to inactivate the excess serotonin. It will go through the liver to the right side of the circulation and can affect the right side of the right valves of the heart, what we call the tricuspid valve and the pulmonary valves. You have two chambers in every side of the heart, the small one, which is the atrium, and you have the big one, which is the ventricle. And usually the blood passes from the atrium to the ventricle to the specific valves, which is supposed to close after the blood goes, for example, from the atrium to the ventricle. If that did not happen and it's still open, as you're having like <clears throat> a loose door, the blood will go backwards again from the ventricle to the atrium. And that will increase the volume and the load on your heart. So that's how the mechanism is started. So which patients really are high risk? Again, most of the patients who are having a small bowel, mid-gut, or having a long neuroendocrine tumor, we see it more in the typical, more than the atypical bronchial carcinoid, and they already have a liver metastasis. These are the patients who are at risk for developing carcinoid heart disease. And having carcinoid heart disease can be a big problem. It definitely can impact the overall survival of our patients, and it also can deprive some of the patients for some treatments. So if I have someone with carcinoid heart disease and developed heart failure, I think he will not be as good candidate to, for example, PRRT or other aggressive treatment compared to someone who does not have this complication. So that's something we definitely have to keep in mind. So what are the symptoms? If it's getting worse and the patient develop heart failure, think about it. The, blood is, the, the heart is not able to push the blood in the right direction to the whole body because there's a lot of volume overload in the right side. If that's happened, there's a lot of fluid accumulation. It can start with your leg. If it is getting worse, it can go to the thigh and then the belly, what we call the ascites, and then even can go to your lung and the patient start having bilateral pleural effusion and pulmonary edema. If that's happened, we, we would like to catch this patient as early as enough because it will have a significant impact in your survival and your outcome. And that's why it's very important during our discussion and physical exam, I always ask my patient if I know that they have a mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor, it's functional or bronchial carcinoid. One of the most important questions every single visit, 
Do you have any more fatigue? You know, when you do your daily routine exercise, do you feel more tired? Do you feel more fatigued? Do you start to have coughing? In my physical exam, I have to examine their legs, their belly, listen very carefully to their heart. If I have or I listen to any murmur, which is specific sound that the valve is not working right, I have to refer these patients to cardiology immediately. And that's very important to have a cardiology expert in carcinoid heart disease within your team and to follow up these patients routinely with you. So having higher 5-HIA by itself have been correlated with where worse CHD. So when you see the patient here in this trial who have a baseline 5-HIA and the other hormone, which is the PNP, that's a specific hormone which is coming from the cardiac muscle when there's a stretch or volume overload, you can see if you have a lower or controlled 5-HIA Definitely, the patient correlated with the high 5-HIA, the patient can have a worse uh, carcinoid heart disease. So there's a very positive correlation and attribution between the level of your serotonin and the worsening level of the carcinoid heart disease. The same with the PNP as well. So these are the two labs that we are going to discuss about that your oncologist and cardiologist is going to follow up with. And for the sake of God, stop doing the chromogranin A. We don't need it anymore. So you need... To have the 5-HIAA, you need to have the PNP if the patient develops the symptoms of carcinoid heart disease. Again, if you have worse carcinoid heart disease, as I told you from the beginning, you can have a poor outcome. It definitely is impacting your survival. And this study have compared to the patient who have several degrees of carcinoid heart disease in the left, left graph, as you can see. The patient who does not have the disease or mild form will have much higher overall survival significantly compared to someone have a severe degree of carcinoid heart disease. And this was correlated with the 5-HIA, as you see in the right side. So the patient who have more controlled 5-HIA either does not have the disease progression or have a very mild form of carcinoid heart disease compared to someone have 5-HIA very high, more than 500. So correlation of the serotonin definitely attributed to the correlation and the severity of carcinoid heart disease, which at the end is going to impact the overall outcome for our patients. So again, what type of blood work, 5-HIA, either you get the 24-hour urine or the plasma, it doesn't matter, either one of them at your institution if it's available. This is the one that you should follow up with from the beginning. So if the patient coming to my clinic already having diarrhea, which excludes the other causes of diarrhea. I know it is not attributed to, for example, malabsorption, short bowel syndrome, um, and they having flushing. They have other features as well. The 5-HIA should be my marker and my main uh, blood that I should definitely get for my patients. We do it every three to six months sometime, depend on what type of treatment and what type of symptoms the patient have. And PNP is definitely one of the hormones secreted by your cardiac muscle. You can measure it in the blood, will give you a hint about developing of, course of uh, cardiac symptoms and heart failure. And definitely your cardiology is going to follow up with echo. Usually, before even I send my patient, I made my nurse to order the echo, and then I send the patient to the cardiology. He can follow the patient up with me. If the patient already have carcinoid heart disease and we did the echo, everything is normal, depend between one th every one to three years, you have to repeat the echo with your cardiologist. But if you're already having mild or moderate tricuspid regurge or pulmonary regurge, the, maybe the cardiologist will do it more often. In very rare occasions, it also can affect the valves of the left side, but that's very rare compared to the right side. And that's only in subgroup of patients when they develop specific hole, what we call a PFO, and the blood will pass from the right side to the left side immediately instead of going to the lung first. And this minority of patients, but it can develop in some patients, and we have to have a good cardiologist definitely to follow up in that. As you can see here, the picture on the left side, it's showing you the severe tricuspid regurg, this blue color, that the blood is going backward from the big chamber, which is the ventricle to the atrium. So what is, what's our aim and target of controlling serotonin and the carcinoid heart disease? Basically, we have to relieve the symptoms because, again, if your patient is feeling tired all the time, they're developing heart failure, they will not be an optimum candidate for a lot of our treatments. 
and you will be struggle here because you would like to control the tumor bulk, you would like to give them some treatment that you know it will uh, impact their overall survival, impact their quality of life, but you know that the, the side effects, you may, they may not be able to tolerate that because they're having a severe heart failure or they are not candidate for this, for this type of medications. Usually the methods, again, the medical oncologist is going to start specific medication to control the serotonin, and that includes the somatostatin analogs, and the, now we have the zermelo as well. We have another rescue shots. Uh, we are going to discuss that in the couple, next couple of the slides. Uh, surgical oncologist with cytoreduction, it can help sometimes with reduce the tumor bulk and uh, reducing the hormone level. Most of the data that we have are retrospective, so we don't have a very good prospective trial to show us that. But it did show that in some of the trials that I'm going to share up with you as well. Some patients, when they have mainly liver disease, liver-directed therapy also can help reduce the tumor bulk, can help also with biochemical response, decreasing the serotonin and also uh, improving the quality of life after the four to six weeks of complications that the patient can have after liver-directed therapy. Again, you need to have a good cardiologist and definitely a cardiothoracic surgeon if you do need a valve replacement. So again, the fibrosis is not only in the heart. It can happen again in the mesentery. Remember this mesh, which is uh, connecting your in intestine with the abdominal wall and the patient can have mesenteric ischemia, basically affecting the blood supply to your intestine. And usually this patient complaining of abdominal pain, maybe 20 to 30 minutes every time after they eat. And that's an important question I usually ask them about that. They also can have the mesenteric fibrosis, this mesh around your you know, intestine, which can obstruct your bowel and the patient can develop a small bowel obstruction, which can be really sometimes uh, serious and life-threatening. So if you catch it as early enough, um, I think it will be reasonable to send this patient uh, from the beginning to your surgical oncology. Uh, if there's a lot of fibrosis, retroperitoneal as well, that can affect the small tubes coming out from the kidney, the ureter, and the patient can have what we call hydroureter or hydronephrosis and can cause blockage and some of the patient can have what we call the acute kidney injury. So it can affect multiple organs in addition to the heart as well. In your skin, if that's happened, the patient develops scleroderma. It's a disease that your skin will lose elasticity and will develop a lot of complications accordingly. It also can affect the vessels, as we said, connecting the heart to the lung and the patient will develop pulmonary hypertension. So you can see that the serotonin can really causing a lot of problems inside the heart, outside the heart, and it's very important to consider this from the beginning, get the right lab work and control it by any way that we can to, to avoid all these complications. So he's the main troublemaker, so we have to get it down, we have to control it. And how we can do that, so first of all, getting the right lab test, and again, you're getting the exos of 5-HIAA. Serum serotonin by itself is not very specific. It's a mood hormone, can be fluctuating in 24 hours, can be affected by a lot of factors, even very simple factors, like the, you know, when you do the venue puncture, when someone taking the blood for you or processing the specimen, that can affect the level of serum serotonin. So usually you don't get the serum serotonin by itself. You have to order the 5-HIAA. Should I get the blood one? Should I get the urine one? They are very comparable. When they did a study to see the sensitivity and specificity of the serum 5-HIAA uh, or the 24-hour urine, they are very comparable. So either one of them will be accepted if you have it at your institution. The plasma one is just more convenient for our patient. And instead of someone giving you a jar to be on it for 24 hours, it's just easy to take one blood sample and you're done. And usually it takes about 10 to 14 days until we have the results. Don't, don't forget to ask your oncologist. There's a lot of food and medication you have to avoid at least for 72 hours before you have the test. We don't need the tests to come in the early like 30 or 40 and say, you know what, I have 5-HIA high. Um, I don't really have symptoms, but I think I have functional tumor. I, actually, that's not very accurate. So you have to make sure that you avoid all the food which have the tryptophan to avoid a false positive result. So usually when you are going to have this test, review with your oncologist what type of food and what type of medication. The lists are available now online at the CCF, at Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation. Many, many sources 
can give you the list of food and medication that you can avoid before the test to make sure that we have an accurate results. So what is the treatment options? Maybe diet, um, and we are going to ask a, a very important question that we usually get from our patients. If I eat a lot of food having tryptophan, is my tumor getting to get worse? I'm gonna answer this question in the next slide. But maybe the diet will help you and help your quality of life uh, if you're eating a lot of specific foods that make you have more symptoms. So if some patients eating, for example, you know, banana, kiwi, avocado, and start having a lot of diarrhea with them or those fatty food, I always tell the patient, write your own food that really give you a hard time and give you symptoms and try to avoid this food. But there is no a good evidence that it will make definitely your cancer worse. There are some medicine we can give you to help you that, and this is with uh, somatostatin analog. Zermelo is another medication. One of them is going to block the serotonin from outside. One of them is blocking the synthesis of serotonin from inside. What is the effect of our other treatments that we keep forgetting about that? Do we have the other trials using the PRRT, targeted therapy? Um, that, do we have anything in this trial showing that it also associated with biochemical response and can improve the symptoms in our patient? And we are going to discuss that in the next slides. Surgery and liver-directed therapy can help dec decrease uh, the tumor burden that you have, and it also can help, hopefully, decrease the amount of hormone and improve your symptoms. So it's always worth a discussion in some of our patients. So again, there are a specific type of food when they did an analysis or survey for the patient who have carcinoid features, like large meal, alcohol, any food which have tryptophan, high fat, uh, coffee, some patients really when they have this food, it provokes the carcinoid features in them. They have more diarrhea, they have more flushing, but not every patient is the same. Some patient does not have any of that. So the, the main advice here that you should avoid this food only if it gives you a hard time. You should control them before you have your 5-HIA. But you should not by any way think that this food is going to make your cancer worse. There is no any evidence about that. Because if you think it for a minute, if the patient does not have a neuroendocrine tumor, normal, pa normal people, if they eat this food, which have the tryptophan, are they going to develop neuroendocrine tumor? Definitely not. So very simple answer, no. The food is not going to make your cancer worse. It can sometimes provoke or initiate the carcinoid features, and you'll be the only one who can judge that. If you found this specific type of food, just avoid them. And make sure that you have the list to avoid before your test. Surgical debulking, I'm not sure is Eric Lewis still here or not, but that's what make him happy. He always discusses the surgical debulking in patients have metastatic gabnet. And let's put it just for a minute to know what is the story behind that. If you look at all the literature, we don't have a one prospective trial comparing the surgical debulking with the medical treatment. So you cannot say that the overall survivor for sure or the overall outcome is better for surgical debulking compared to the medical treatment. But you can say that all the literature that we have, it's a retrospective or single institution experience there are repeated results that these patients who are qualified to have a surgical debulking, which means they remove sometimes a primary tumor and they remove from 70 to 90% of your lesions, these patients do have a better outcome in this, in this retrospective data. They have better overall survival. They have a good progression-free survival, but it also is associated with some biochemical response and control of symptoms. So most of the trial adapting the 90%. You have to get 90% or more of the lesions. So you can, uh, we have at least six studies showing 60 to 90% of these patients have symptom relief after they have the 90%. The couple of the studies showing that if you have at least 70%, almost 75% of the patient will have subjective symptom a response, they feel better, they have left carcinoid features. And it, this was correlated with biochemical response. So these patients also have less or decrease in the level of 5-HIA. And then we have the debate that again, we don't have any study to compare them. Should I really do the surgery if you're only getting 90% or 70%? No one knows a clear answer about that. Um, do I only go with a specific uh, medical treatment? and that will get me the same outcome at the end. Again, no one knows for, for sure the answer about that because we don't have any prospective trial 
comparing the surgical site to the reduction or debulking with just systemic medical treatment and see what is the end results. What I can tell you is that other than the injection and some effect of the PRRT, most of our other treatment will not have the same biochemical response. So that may suggest that definitely surgical site reduction need to be discussed with these patients. Again, liver directed therapy, there are several trials. Again, none of them is still a big prospective trial. Also with investigating the same question. If I did a liver directed therapy for your liver, we control most of the tumor bulk. Is that going to improve your symptom and have a biochemical response for decreasing the serotonin level? One of the studies showing that eight out of 11 patients, they have almost complete response of their symptoms. This appearance of the diarrhea and flushing um, and the serotonin and 5-HIA was decreased by about 50 to 57%. Another study showing about 63 reduction in the tumor release symptoms. And the recent one that we have from Dr. Strasberg, about 80% symptom improvement and 80% have also associated with some biochemical response. So definitely there is a benefit from liver-directed therapy, especially if you have exclusively liver disease. If you are a, someone with a mid-gut neuroendocrine tumor or bronchial and have a specifically exclusive disease in your liver, it's worth a discussion in the tumor board if you are eligible for that. The main systemic treatment, it's basically our injection, and we are going to discuss what is the impact of the PRRT on the symptom control and biochemical response. So what is somatostatin? Somatostatin is a hormone that your body is secreting from different parts of your body, including the hypothalamus, and the main function is to decrease any other hormones. The problem on somatostatin, it's only working for one or two minutes. So logically, you cannot just makes the patient sit beside you and gives them treatment every one to two minutes. You have to see something more long acting, a synthetic form of somatostatin. This is why we have the somatostatin analog. How, how does it work? Very simply, if you have the lock, we have the key, which mean if you have the somatostatin receptors in the imaging, whether it is the gallium 68 or carbon 64, we will have the injection which is going to attach to these receptors and blocking the hormone secretion and blocking the cell from growing. Um, and this is, will be the imaging that will show us if you have the receptors or not. So it's definitely predictive for effectiveness. You are aware of these two um, phase three trials, the PROMET trial using the octoreotide, which is intramuscular injection, and clarinet trial using linerotide, which is subcutaneous. This phase three trial showing delay in the cancer progression. So if I'm going to start that in my patient, I always tell them if I do the imaging three to four months from now, don't expect that your lesions are going to get smaller. It's going to lock yourself from growing or sh not really shrinking your, your cancer. But actually, the somatostatin started even before that, that they can control the hormone secretion. So it's also locking the cell from producing the hormone. So this is with some analysis have been done with the sandostatin, which is the long-acting octoreotide. And it did show that the, definitely putting the patient on the somatostatin analog they will have a continuous symptom control, including diarrhea and flushing, and definitely will also be associated with hormone reduction, almost more than 50% reduction in the 5-HIA. And this was also repeated with somatulin as well, and retired also having the same effect. So somatostatin analog can decrease your hormone, can decrease your serotonin level, can make the patients feel better, improve the quality of life, um, and that's something we need to keep in mind. So this is a new medication. Most of you maybe heard about it already. The uh, bel belos, uh, beltos, uh, I'm sorry, I can't really pronounce it. Beltocetine, okay? So this is an oral somatostatin receptor agonist, which already got an FDE um, you know, orphan uh, designation for treating of acromegaly. It's another um, endocrine condition. But now we're using the same somatostatin agonist in patients who are either naive or they are stable um, uh, on the somatostatin injection. And these patients having well-differentiated metastatic neuroendocrine tumor in the small bowel or the pancreas. Again, if you did not start any somatostatin analog before, or you have been in your linerotide or um, octoreotide and you have a stable disease, you may be qualified for this trial. And this is an oral medication. A lot of our patients complaining that, you know, they have some pain, 
um, they develop this gluteal nodule sometime, which can be bothering for, for our patient, definitely taking injection. But it's always overall very well tolerated medication as a somatostatin analog, either subcutaneous or intramuscular. But if you can develop that by an oral form, a lot of patients will definitely prefer that. In the studies, you will have 30 patients. This is a phase two randomized uh, trial, and they are going to examine the 40 milligram and the 80 milligram. So make sure if you have that to consider it and discuss about it with your oncologist if you have the trial at your institution. If you still have symptoms, just for the sake of time, I'm, I'm trying to go fast here, you still can have the rescue shot up to three times a day. Zermelo is one of the medication blocking the serotonin synthesis from inside, and one of the amino acid textures, the intrade, I'm gonna put one slide on it so you can know how it works. So again, the Telestar, it's one of the big randomized trials showing that patients who are already on somatostatin analog, you still have the diarrhea, you still have the flushing. This patient can be qualified for Zermelo. It does uh, decrease the amount of bowel movement and also is as associated with biochemical response, decrease in the serotonin level. And this was a real world evidence showing the same improvement in the bowel movement and overall carcinoid features. So definitely if you still have symptoms after your injection, discuss with your oncologist the options of adding their mellow. The Intrade, it is one of the advanced oncology formula. It's just a drink like the Post. It helps modulate the intestinal epithelial membrane. It decreases the permeability. It also increases the sodium and the water absorption. So it helps decrease the frequency of the bowel movement. So that's something also that you can uh, talk to your nutritionist as one of the team for the neuroendocrine tumors in your institution, and you can discuss if you are eligible uh, for this type of, of boost or drink that can help with your bowel movement. Does the PRRT have any impact on the bowel movement and the 5-HIA? The NETR1 trial itself did not mention that in the trial, but there's a lot of subgroup analysis have been done after that. And it did show that definitely it have improvement in the amount of diarrhea, bowel movement, quality of life, and all that was associated with the decrease of the 5-HIA. So the PRRT is not only to sh shrink your cancer, but about now we say 15 to 18%. It also can improve your quality of life and it can help to decrease the serotonin as well. So the take home points I would like you to always understand, serotonin is the main factor and driver for most of the complication of carcinoid feature, carcinoid heart disease, mesenteric fibrosis, bowel obstruction. Make sure that you discuss your options. Uh, first, of getting the right blood work, the 5-HIA, either the plasma or the 24-hour urine. You should have the list of the food and medication to avoid before that. Make sure that you discuss with your oncologist if surgical debulking is an option for you, if we are talking about more tumor burden or liver-directed therapy. Uh, if you are in the injections already and you have the oral therapy trial at your institution, it will be something convenient for some patient to maybe ask your oncologist about. And if you're already in the injection and still having the symptoms, make sure you ask about the rescue shot, the Zermelo, peering refer to a cardiologist, and to have a neuroendocrine tumor expert taking care of you at the same time, because it will make a big difference in your quality of life and overall survival. And this is the end. Thank you so much.